and this is my great honor um, to introduce my colleague, friend, co-conspirator, um, partner in crime, um, Nusheen Ranjbar. Um, so Nusheen was born and raised in Iran um, until immigrating to the U.S. in her adolescence. Um, and has developed a passion for holistic view of medicine and healing throughout her entire life. Um, she has many, many different hats, um, but amongst those hats, she's started the Integrative Psychiatry Clinic at the University of Arizona. She's the program director for the Integrative Psychiatry Fellowship Program at the University of Arizona, um, and um, an assistant professor of psychiatry at the U of A. Um, she is passionate in working with the underserved and doing asylum uh, work um, and doing mind-body medicine for the underserved and working with um, Native American populations. Um, I don't think that you can find too many people who would um, who would go to the areas and do the way and 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 well, how shall how shall I say this? I think Nusheen's dedication to integrative psychiatry um, is is unprecedented, um, spends hours and hours of work um, out of the goodness of her heart, really trying to move this field uh, forward. And it's a pleasure to be her colleague and to hear every time I listen to Nusheen, even though we've been friends for 10 years um, and work together, I still learn something every time um, I hear from her. So I'm grateful um, that she'll be presenting to us um, on one of her many passions, mind body medicine and the foundations of it. And amongst other things, she does serve on faculty at the Center for Mind Body Medicine. So, with that, I will hand it over to Nusheen. Thank you, Amelia, my sister, partner in crime in all things integrative. And um, so, I'm delighted to be here. Um, Thank you everybody for coming and I'm going to be um, sharing about one of my most favorite topics within our expanding field of integrative psychiatry and that is mind body medicine. Um, and one of the reasons I really wanted to talk about this is that mind body medicine has in many ways saved my life um, and helped me stay within medicine. Um, I, uh, as Amelia said, I'm an immigrant myself and um, thought I was gonna go into medicine since I was four because my mom was sick with cancer and long story short, um, I, within a year of internship in family medicine, I burned out and became quite depressed and didn't want to have anything to do with medicine. Um, and that really started my own healing journey. Um, I left medicine, I left training, which, um, you know, what had been uh, something I'd worked towards for 20 some years, and um, it was very devastating. And, um, and part of it was that, you know, I grew up in Iran seeing medicine and thinking of medicine and healing as being very integrative and holistic and multifaceted. And, uh, you know, my mom who had autoimmune disorders would um, one day, it was just me and her living together. So one day we were at the apothecary, you know, where she was trying herbs. And one day we were at the acupuncturist where she was getting pain support. And one day we were at the regular medical doctor getting medications. Uh, and I was you know, giving her B12 shots. So I grew up seeing medicine as uh, truly multi, multifaceted and really about healing and discovery and thinking outside the box. And so when I came to medical school in the US uh, in the 90s and uh, realized that everything was separate and I couldn't talk about half the stuff I, you know, had tried and knew about because it didn't fit the, the, the schema at the time, I think it broke my heart. Um, so I was like, I, I'm not sure I can fit in to a, a medical system if it's not gonna, you know, honor uh, many ways to heal and different aspects of what it takes someone to heal. So I think all of that kind of caught up with me in addition to my own, uh, you know, need for healing that was probably there all along. And so when I kind of broke down as an intern and resident in family medicine, I felt like it was, I was the biggest failure and I was never going to be able to um, 
refined my place in this field. And it took me five years. I remember people saying, nobody leaves medicine for five years in the middle of training and is able to get back in. So I'm, I guess I'm a poster child for anything is possible because those five years allowed me to learn about myself and about the interconnectedness of my epigenetics and mind and emotions and body and grief and unresolved anger and all kinds of things that I had that I didn't even realize I was holding on to. Um, and that allowed me to fall in love with the field of trauma and an integrative approach to trauma and came back to training this time in psychiatry. And it happened to be at the University of Arizona. Um, and this is where I kind of refound my love for healing as, as I know it now. Um, and it, you know, then took me to Boston Children's as I followed Amelia around the country um, because she has been uh, truly a sister and uh, rock. Um, and, uh, and so then when I came back to the University of Arizona as faculty, uh, our real vision was to bring uh, back the soul of medicine into psychiatry. And um, I'm happy to say I'm still here six years later, and um, I'm delighted that you're all here. And so mind-body medicine is really at the core of everything that we do, and, um, and I am going to share a little bit about it with you. So my only disclosure is that um, I have lived and continuing to struggle to uh, find the interconnectedness between my own mind, body, emotions, spirit, uh, belief systems, uh, struggle as we work through this healthcare system and also an unprecedented time in the globe where we are all feeling uncertain and disconnected and finding, trying to look for places that feel um, integrated and integrative and whole for ourselves, for our trainees, for our patients. And this is a labyrinth that we built right outside my house. I'm lucky enough to live in Tucson, Arizona, where uh, the land is vast and beautiful and hot, and um, you can build labyrinths like this. So, um, so just uh, because this is our first uh, uh, presentation for the academic year, for anyone who's new to this field, we're thankful to people like Dr. Lake um, and Helgeson and others who put together this uh, paper that um, back in 2012, uh, that kind of outlines what is integrative psychiatry. I think we sometimes get lost in words and names and um, you know, put things in boxes, but really integrative psychiatry is about coming back to recognizing the interconnectedness of both our own mind, body, spirit, connection, self-awareness as clinicians, but also those of the people that we are serving and how to recreate and help heal the system we're part of so that it doesn't add to people's traumas and stresses, but instead honors them for who they are. Um, sorry, I'm having some uh, noises in the background, uh, but to really honor them who they, for who they are, what belief traditions and cultures they come from, see them as whole people, see them with innate capacity to heal. Uh, so not just give people diagnoses that further stigmatize them and make them think that something is wrong with them, but see the illness as a process within which people can grow and um, and heal and transform into stronger, wiser, more resourced, more connected human beings. Um, and in order to do that, integrative psychiatry uses anything that is safe, has evidence behind it, and the person is open to that could help them. So that's anything from addressing their nutrition and lifestyle and uh, using medications judiciously and considering interactions and side effects and, and looking at the biopsycho-socio-spiritual model of what's going on. Um, like the famous saying that says, it's not as important what the disease the person has, but what is, who is the person who has the disease? You know, what are they bringing 
into their treatment, both from underlying uh, mechanisms that have contributed to for them to be ill and struggling, but also all of their strengths, all of their gifts, and, and never lose that in our strength-based way of approaching patients. Um, looking at wellness and prevention and advocating for structures in our politics and social um, world to put more emphasis on how do we prevent and promote mental health so that we're not just as psychiatrists um, putting out fires and uh, getting support, getting to people only when things get so bad that, you know, they're, they're falling off the, the curve of their lives. And to make sure it's done in a compassionate way, uh, person-centered, and that it um, empowers people to take better care of themselves and that they're not a victim to be taken through a treatment process, but truly a, an active agent and participant. Um, so with that being said, mind-body medicine is at the core and the backbone of all of that. Because when we are under stress, when we are traumatized, when we are neglectful of the connection between our mind, body, spirit, emotions, belief systems, culture, that's when we suffer the most because we feel broken, we feel uh, victimized, we feel alone, we feel no one's gonna understand what we're going through. And so, and that's true for the clinician, for the physician, as well as the patient. And, and so um, Amelia and I both went through the Center for Mind-Body Medicine professional training um, as residents back a thousand years ago, it feels like now. And she actually um, you know, pulled my hand and made me go to one of these trainings. And I kicked and screamed and said, you know, I don't know how to meditate. I'm never going to be able to sit still. What are you talking about? And, and now many, many years later, this is the foundation of what we have every resident experience and every patient learn about um, because it is truly transformative. So uh, if the person is not, um, doesn't have the skills to self-regulate and feel connected and be aware of what they're feeling and where they're feeling it and, and what's going on with them, it is much harder to then ask them to change what they're eating or uh, help them change their relationships with their loved ones or change their sleep patterns or, you know, not scream at their child or, you know, not fight or throw things at another person or be connected to nature. It's all, um, it really takes a, a set of skills and a, and a, a format within which to help people build certain capacities within themselves that then they can incorporate into everything they're doing. Uh, so it's not a pill and it's not a fix it all, but it is absolutely foundational because without knowing the connection between the psycho neuroimmunology of stress and disease and sensations and emotions, people um, have a hard time grasping why it's so important to address all the other things that are important in, in, uh, in an integrative framework of mental health. So the uh, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine that is now called the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, NCCIH, uh, defined mind-body medicine as a type of medicine that focuses on the interactions between the brain, mind, body, behavior, and the powerful ways that all of these factors affect our health. And uh, that self-knowledge and self-care, self-awareness needs to be at the core of healthcare. And that is what this is all based on. So there are many, many techniques, most of them from ancient traditions. Uh, you know, meditation has helped uh, tribes and communities around the world uh, stay sane as possible and survive for thousands of years. Same thing with imagery and movement and ceremonies and rituals and uh, finding group support in healthy, safe spaces, um, being mindful of what we put into our body, uh, expressing ourselves creatively through poetry and writing and drawing and movement and music, um, and uh, the more scientific 
uh, twist to some of these like biofeedback um, and autogenics. And so these, these modalities have been around forever and ever, but now we have modern scientific literature like Dr. Lebretsky was mentioning that is actually helping us through the research to reconnect with wisdom that's been around forever, but it's so easy to lose it without uh, really bringing the science and the, the practices together in a way that is accessible to people who otherwise may not even be from those cultures or be from these cultures that have become so disconnected from where they come from that they uh, take for granted their uh, ancestors' uh, teachings about the connection to the breath. Uh, like that breathing exercise Amelia so nicely led us in earlier on. It's amazing how we have access to these free aspects of our own body, but we rarely use them because we don't even think that they are going to work or we don't know. We haven't had a chance to learn the science and skills and practice it long enough to see, wow, you know, when I meditate every day, it does feel different. I make different decisions throughout the day. I react differently to the stresses around me, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and so part of the reason the, the mind-body model really works well with a lot of tribal communities and people from minoritized um, cultures is that they already know this stuff in their genes. Their ancestors have been practicing them for thousands of years. So to them, it's like, oh, so modern science has finally figured out that what we've been, you know, taught forever and then, you know, the colonizers came and said, all of your ways are wrong, get rid of them. You mean all of that is finally being um, honored and accepted and actually being promoted? Hmm, how interesting. So it can be an interesting way to really uh, bridge the gap of the East and the West or the modern and the ancient. Um, and uh, we have evidence. So, so that's the beauty and why we incorporate this into the academic uh, training in integrative psychiatry is because uh, we have had to go to academia and go to the department chairs and go to the um, healthcare administration and say, we know now from the literature what happens when some of these techniques are incorporated into people's treatment regimens and prevention regimens and how they can help address migraine and stress and PTSD and attention and brain structure and cancer and hypertension. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, so, uh, and so once you have the data and the research then, and you put a proposal that you want, you know, your residents to go through this, then they're like, oh, that sounds like an interesting idea. Let's try it and see what happens. Um, the other thing we have is the work of Dr. Levine and Dr. Porges, which I'll talk about a little more, uh, but really about heart rate var variability and about the capacity of our nervous system to be riled up uh, during a stressful period naturally, and then its capacity to come back down to a place of parasympathetic rest. And so in a, in a normative ideal situation, we have stress and stress is actually good for us. Believe it or not, it, it helps us grow and we are able to move through that hill and with support and with uh, self-regulation techniques, we're able to uh, reintroduce uh, our vagal system and our parasympathetic and be able to recover and that makes us actually stronger and prepare us for the next challenge and the next challenge. And so this is like absolutely necessary for little babies who, you know, everything's provided for in the womb and then they, we come out and we are at the mercy of our environment for every need and, and possible, um, you know, things that can go wrong our nervous system needs to learn how to deal with stress. And, and so if we have the skills and the um, adequate support uh, from those around us, then our nervous system learns how to do this really well and we continue to take on bigger and bigger challenges without completely losing it and falling apart. However, on quite regular uh, regularity, uh, the stresses pile up so much and our capacity to deal with them are so uh, uh, not enough that we can get stuck into the sympathetic overload or completely crash and freeze into a parasympathetic overload 
in which we are dissociated, we're disconnected, we're just going through the motions, or we are so hyper aroused that we um, become sensitized to more stress. You know, every little thing just kind of gets on our uh, nerve and we just can't handle it. And that's what happened to me when I was burned out and just couldn't show up to work anymore and had to take five years off. And, and I don't wish that on anyone. And so, and so now we know that when our system becomes so overwhelmed in either of these extremes, then we are more susceptible to all of these illnesses uh, that there's no pill for. And that's another reason why um, this science is so important in bringing integrative approaches to health to the forefront. And every cell of the body is affected, every hormone, every organ. So there is a, a, no cell goes untouched by the effects of sympathetic and parasympathetic overload in our system. And you all know about the effects of cortisol and how excessive it really affects um, many, many conditions, including um, psychiatric and other uh, medical conditions. And, the doc and I mentioned the work of Dr. Levine and Dr. Porges because with the polyvagal theory and with the work that Dr. Levine has done with somatic experiencing and out in wilderness, they've really helped us see that we are social animals and we um, have the capacity to support each other and train our vagal system to more often be able to be in the prefrontal cortex where we are able to um, make decisions and respond to situations from an empowered wise place instead of giving um, up to our lower animal nature that wants to fight, flight, freeze, run away, avoid, check out, dissociate. And, and this is up to us to support each other to build those skills because most of us don't have them. A lot of us don't have them, which is part of the reason our our society is suffering so much on so many levels, especially if people are living in poverty, downtrodden, subject to racism, many, many other ills of what they deal with. There is no way we can, you know, fix everything with, um, with what we have. We really have to go the empowerment route, the education route, the training route, um, on many, many levels, including the individual, the community, the administration, et cetera. Um, and it's partly because stress and trauma breaks us. And I shared my story, but basically we start to feel like we are not um, whole, we're broken. And when that goes unhealed for long enough, then we feel like we are not connected to our identity. You know, why am I even here? Why, why am I going through the motions? Why am I working so hard? You know, what do I believe in? Um, and we can treat others in ways that uh, then make us, you know, not proud of ourselves. And then that builds more shame and then more guilt. And the cycle just goes on and on. And we know that the more the stress happens earlier in life, the more it affects our uh, entire nervous system and hormonal system, et cetera, with the ACEs study of Dr. Folletti. And we know that it's not just going to war and that kind of traumatic stress that matters, but all the little things like having a household member who's incarcerated or having parents fight and separate and divorce and, you know, whatever we uh, take away from that in our little child's mind when that happens or uh, when our parent is treated unjustly with racism or domestic violence or when we're neglected in some form. All of this ends up uh, creating um, a mass effect on our stress nervous system and that affects our psyche and our emotions and how we behave and how we react. And it is an epidemic. So it's not just, you know, those couple of people who had, you know, difficult childhoods. It is actually almost all of us. And we just don't even think of it because it has been just part of what happens. And we haven't really known how to deal with it, especially the people who are coming to us as patients um, and are already struggling with the stigma and not even wanting to tell us what has happened to them because they wonder if they're going to be judged. 
And so you all are familiar with these different responses. So that tend and befriend is, is the part that really brings in the social engagement network, uh, supporting community building, uh, breathing together, discussing together, um, supporting each other as we learn skills and build on, um, on these mind-body medicine uh, techniques. And a lot of it is really reconnecting us to the innate uh, capacity of the body to release, process, discharge, and transform emotions through breathing, crying, screaming, yawning, sweating, laughing, sleeping, shaking, uh, moving, dancing, the stuff that our little baby version came into the world already knowing how to do. And a lot of the times we have forgotten to do any of them because we're not drinking enough water, so we're not pooping or peeing and that's keeping the toxins in our body. We're not crying because it's too whatever to cry, and so we're holding that toxin and stress in. We're not breathing deeply because all of our um, muscles are uh, affected by the sympathetic response, and we're tense, and so we're not taking deep breaths. And you can go through every one of these and see how uh, not fully accessing this because we are in fight or flight, or freeze much of the time, we're actually missing out on our inherent body's capacity to heal on a regular basis from those ups and downs of the stress curve and the heart rate variability changes. And what we know through the research is that different emotions, when they get stuck, actually live in different parts of the body. So they've done, you know, these fancy uh, thermogram um, uh, studies where, you know, they have people uh, think about feeling a certain emotion, sadness, uh, envy, shame, pride, contempt, love, you know, hatred, whatever. And you can actually see um, patterns in the body where these things are lighting up. And it connects with the tr ancient traditional Chinese medicine um, notion of how we how energy, emotion is really energy. And so when it doesn't move, when it doesn't get released, it gets stuck somewhere. And that can contribute to, to disease and inflammation and inability to, for that aspect of our system to clear and, and be fully present. Um, and we know about, you know, people who have high anxiety and a lot of anger and, um, and, and a lot of stress being at higher risk for heart disease and heart attacks and all these different things. And so just, a, I know my time is up, but basically uh, mind-body medicine includes simple activities like autogenics and, uh, and biofeedback. We use thermistors where people can actually begin to notice the changes in their body temperatures. And we do this with everyone. So from medical students to our residents to um, doing many, many more sessions now that uh, we have the COVID situation happening. We work with Native American tribes. Here is a picture of my beloved uh, family, uh, extended family in Pine Ridge. Uh, we have research in PTSD uh, with youth showing reduction of PTSD scores with uh, a series of mind-body skills trainings in Gaza. Um, here are some lovely pictures of Jim Gordon doing uh, mind-body groups with little kids in Gaza. Some work we've done with suicide prevention and the Pine Ridge Reservation through an ANA grant with the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, as well as a brand new uh, NIH grant that we have now through the Department of Family Medicine with this lovely woman, Francine Gachupin, uh, which is a five-year project incorporating mind-body skills for uh, all the tribal communities in Arizona, which is the first of its kind, really bringing the ideas of nutrition, education, physical activity, and mind-body medicine for parents and kids um, on a mass scale. Uh, online groups happening with the Center for Mind-Body Medicine now for providers, healthcare providers, frontline workers, et cetera, et cetera. I want to put a shout out for the Physician Support Line, which is an example of how empowered people can advocate and, and create system change. Uh, the same here, global movement that is working to destigmatize mental health through mind-body approaches. And I will end by saying that when we feel connected enough, empowered enough, healed enough, 
we are able to create change on many, many levels by advocating for all kinds of things. And I hope that part of that becomes helping revolutionize how we treat mental health and how we teach psychiatry. Um, and um, thank you all so much.